Thank you for coming out in the slushy, rainy weather. Um, as you can see, our seats are filling slowly, but we should get on with the program. We have a full day of activities today. My name is Takao Hench. I'm the director of the NIMH Silvio Conti Center here at Harvard, which is hosting today with a, a variety of stakeholders you'll hear about in a moment. Um, it's our pleasure to welcome you here as part of our outreach series and uh, the end of J term for the undergraduates who are already back on campus. Um, this event was a long time coming and uh, uh, my partner, Michaela Fagiolini, and I have been trying uh, to collect um, a very interdisciplinary group of participants, including all of you um, who will uh, play an active role in the afternoon. <coughs> Um, but before we get on to the program, I just wanted to turn it over to Michaela so she could thank some of the other non-Conti um, stakeholders and participants in the event. So good morning. Somewhere in the universe there is a sunny day and warm, so let's think positive and stay on that idea. So first of all, I would like to thank everybody who signed up, who's still maybe not here, but will come, and really thank you. We are hoping to expand our family. This is a, an event where we are not telling you or teaching you anything. We are dancing together and playing music together. So we hope it will be an, an event of emotions and connection. I would like to thank several um, institutions who help us. First of all, Boston Children's say. Hospital, where and I work, the <laughs> Young Tang Center on Autism at Harvard. I would like to thank the Virgin Airlines who help, that help us to make a, a flight for Derek and his team a little more pleasant. And also I would like to thank especially the Italian consulate because at the last minute, but they help us to support. There's a strong representation from Italians in this event and they help us a lot. So I would like a few words from the general council and then we start the event. Thank you, Michaela, uh, Professor Hensch. Um, so, thank you for uh, being here, uh, welcome to this event, and um, let me say, let me start by saying that I'm very glad to be here, but also very proud, because uh, there is also, uh, by the, the research, the activity of uh, Professor Michela Fagiolini and uh, Takao Hersch, which I uh, thank you so much, we have the possibility also to um, to, sh to present, uh, uh, to showcase uh, some uh, um, Italian expertise in a very specific uh, sector. Since I'm not really uh, expert of uh, this specific sector, I, I wrote something and <laughs> allow me to, to, to read. Um, so Italy, uh, who is very well represented in this event and you will uh, discover uh, throughout the day, uh, has become a model of excellence in the use of music therapy, an alternative therapeutic approach which uses the abilities of music to encourage positive changes and improve person's well-being. This therapy, which is widely used in public, private schools and health facility in Italy, but of course, uh, I think in many, many other countries, and I think also here in the United States, represent a valid alternative to traditional healing remedies which rely exclusively on the use of medicine. And today we will be hearing from distinguished guest speakers on how music therapists use patients' response and connection to music. We look forward to hearing from them. In the afternoon, we will have the opportunity to know more of a specific method of music therapy by Dario Masala, founder of the project Swim and Swing, who will illustrate how the power of musical rhythm and water can promote the improvement of movement, motor awareness, emotional well-being, and social inclusion. Thank you to the organizers of this special event and to the presenters and speakers for their invaluable contribution to the study of neuroscience and music. Thank you for being here and uh, uh, looking forward to the, to the event. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I think we can start. Okay, thank you. So um, the mission of these Conti centers is to bring uh, state-of-the-art neuroscience research to bear on questions of relevance to mental health and mental illness, as well as to uh, reduce the stigma around mental health and mental illness um, 
by uh, understanding mechanism and having events such as this one. And uh, we really look forward to the role that music plays in all of our lives uh, today. We've divided it into a morning session on the neuroscience of music and um, transition through a wonderful performance uh, that we're hoping to hear from Derek Paravicini and lecture about um, uh, neurodevelopment and neurodevelopmental disorders. And in the afternoon, uh, transition to music therapies and involve all of you in activities both outside this room and then back here to hear about how they work. So um, with that, I hope to see all of you throughout the day. Um, I should also mention that uh, food and catering was graciously provided by the support of the Italian consulate, and I hope you'll partake of that. Technically, we're not supposed to be eating in here, so um, <laughs> try to keep it clean, but outside you'll have lunch and a reception as well. So um, in the interest of time, I hope Robert and Psyche will forgive me to keep introductions to a minimum. Um, and uh, we just want to emphasize how luck we, lucky we are here today to have uh, leading experts on the neuroscience of music uh, here with us to tell us about um, perception and motion and emotion. So our first speaker is Professor Robert Zatore from McGill University, who's uh, flown down here to be with us today. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here. I'm really delighted. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Takao and, uh, and the organizers uh, for this, um, what I hope will be both uh, a great scientific event and uh, also a wonderful um, opportunity for us to sort of learn from each other and especially to have music. I already heard a little bit of the rehearsal, so I'm really looking forward to that. So uh, what I would like to tell you about today is some of the research uh, that we've been doing over the years um, on uh, the neuroscience of music. And um, basically trying to uh, give you a background so that you understand some of the uh, neural mechanisms that underlie both our ability to perceive music and to produce it uh, as well as to enjoy it and derive uh, pleasure and emotion from it. And I would like to start uh, my lectures with this uh, pretty well-known quote from Darwin. I see there's a really nice mural of Darwin out there uh, in the lobby. <clears throat> and uh, this is what everyone uh, is familiar with uh, uh, about Darwin uh, and his view on music. He said, neither the enjoyment nor the capacity of producing musical notes are of any direct use to humans. And so they're among the most mysterious abilities that, that we have. He sort of was throwing up his hands and said, I don't know, what's music? Why is it there? I have no idea. And that was in The Descent of Man in 1871. But then in his autobiography, he's writing very personally about how he's feeling uh, late in his life. And he says, if I had to live my life again, I would have made it a rule to read some poetry and listen to some music at least once every week, for perhaps the parts of my brain now atrophied would thus have been kept active through use. And that's an endorsement of music therapy for those of you who are in that field. And then he says this, the loss of these tastes is a loss of happiness and may be injurious to the intellect and the moral character by enfeebling the emotional part of our nature. And I find this super insightful. And he actually answers the question that he couldn't answer 10 years earlier, right? He actually says, well, that's what music is about. It's really to enhance the emotional part of our nature. So if we take that sort of concept, then we say, well, music is really about um, emotion and uh, emotional arousal, the ability to express and communicate emotion, uh, and also to regulate emotion, uh, both self-regulation by, uh, by mood manipulation, but also um, to um, change the, the uh, emotions of others, to regulate the emotions of others. So my entire uh, sort of concept comes down to these three points. The question is, how is it that the brain allows us to uh, um, generate music and derive pleasure from it? And my answer are <clears throat> these three uh, points. First of all, that there are neural mechanisms that have to do with per uh, perception and prediction. 
Um, and these are uh, found in the auditory cortex and the circuits that interconnect the auditory cortex with the rest of the brain. The second um, uh, element is the neural mechanisms that underlie pleasure and reward. And the basic idea that I would like to promote to you is that it's the interaction between those two systems that is behind our ability to um, uh, enjoy uh, and derive pleasure from music. So it's essentially um, a tale of these two systems. So the first one on the left is the auditory um, cortical system, uh, and then the reward system. I'm going to go through those two systems in turn and then talk to you about how they might interact. Now, before we get to the auditory cortex, which is found approximately here. Oh, you don't have a, you don't see my cursor. And this doesn't seem to do anything, uh, unless I'm pointing it the wrong way. Well, the auditory cortex uh, is found <clears throat> in these uh, red and orange sort of regions. And of course, there are quite a number of brainstem nuclei that um, uh, uh, receive inputs from um, the ear and transmit it up to the auditory cortex. We're really not going to talk about the inferior colliculus and the medial geniculate body and various other structures. Thank you very much. Ah, there you go. But uh, the auditory cortex itself is found here. And then there are connections that emerge from there and that go along the rest of the temporal lobe here and into the frontal cortex. And um, we refer to these as the ventral stream because they go along the inferior part of the brain, the ventrum. Um, and this uh, system has been studied by, by many different groups. It's responsible for many different sorts of uh, functions. Um, <clears throat> But the one I'm going to really focus on is the idea that it's uh, involved in the um, encoding of different kinds of patterns of sound. And importantly, it is uh, able to generate predictions about those patterns. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you have a very simple pattern of tones, like in this experiment from Mark Schinwiesner, um, and then every so often uh, a different tone is presented, you, uh, of course, can detect that something different has happened, and the brain generates a potential uh, both in the uh, auditory region, shown in red, and slightly later in an inferior frontal region, shown in blue. Now, why is that important? Well, it's because it means that um, there's a deviance detection mechanism. In other words, you're able to notice that something has changed, but in order for you to notice that something has changed, it means you must have predicted that the same thing was going to happen that had happened previously, and therefore, there's like a surprise element, right? So it's not just a response to every element. It's a response to the current element in relation to the past element. And that's a kind of prediction. And the brain is extremely good at making predictions. So that's a rather low-level kind of response, right, to just a change in a feature, like the pitch of a tone or the duration of a tone. But you can also get higher-level kinds of um, deviant responses, as shown in this uh, study from Barbara Tillman's group where you have um, a sequence of chords, and then uh, you have a, a cadence, and it ends with a particular, uh, particular chord. Now, this chord can be highly expected, as in this case, for example. This is just a D-flat major chord, and it's a D-flat major uh, context. So that's the common expectation if you are familiar and exposed to Western music. Uh, but here we have a different context. And what's interesting is that the response of the brain to the same item depends on what came before it. So if what came before it was a different, I think this is like a F, uh, F minor uh, context, if what came before it is, um, uh, doesn't quite fit with the ending, then you get a response here. So again, it's a kind of prediction, but this prediction depends on your knowledge of structural features, in this case, harmonic progressions which you've learned, right? You have to have learned this. So if you grew up uh, hearing only uh, music from India, you would have a very different system, and you would have a different kind of response to deviation within that system as opposed to the Western system. Interestingly, when you have um, the uh, disorder known as amusia, or um, congenital uh, amusia, um, uh, or tone deafness, um, we see these uh, changes in the ventral stream. So this is work done by my late colleague, uh, Krista Hyde, 
um, and my uh, former student, uh, Philippe Albuy, and we see here that there are changes in the cortical um, structure in the uh, auditory and inferior frontal cortex and also in the white matter. And we see this in numerous studies in different cities that we've done. So if there is an interruption of that pathway, then you have this disorder where people really don't perceive all kinds of uh, changes in, in music and generally uh, are unable to, uh, to recognize patterns. Now we move on to the, the second major stream, which I'm showing here more in the blue and green uh, palette. Uh, and this is called the dorsal stream because it goes to the dorsum, to the top of the brain. And again, this system is responsible for many, many different functions. Um, I'm really just giving you a very brief overview of, of the complexity here. Um, but what's interesting about the um, dorsal stream is that it inter interconnects the auditory cortex with some of the motor regions which are found up here, in particular the dorsal premotor cortex, as well as the ventral premotor cortex and the parietal lobe. Um, and these systems, of course, have to do with action, with motion, with engaging um, uh, your muscles. And this system is also time dependent in the sense that uh, it's responsible for computations that are carried out in real time, as opposed to the previous one, which sort of accumulates knowledge, like in the case of learning um, uh, chord progressions. That's information that you've learned, the contingencies of those chords over many years, whereas this system is really um, responsive to events that are happening here and now. Uh, and therefore, it's very important for things like uh, rhythm and metrical organization. So in this study from my former student, uh, Joyce Chen, who's now at the University of Toronto, uh, what we did was we took um, rhythmic patterns and uh, we made them either very, very simple and metrically organized, like this one that any of you can tap out, um, or we did a permutation of the same durations, so it's the same elements, just reorganized in a funny way. And so we have this one, which is, I call it metrically complex, because it doesn't really quite fit into any obvious meter, right? If you try to tap it out, da 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 It's not really quite clear. I don't know if I did that correctly, but it's hard to do, in fact. Um, and when we do behavior with this, people are much less accurate. But interestingly, the brain responds to the difference between these two by engaging the dorsal stream, in particular, the premotor regions along with auditory regions. And what's interesting here is that this is a response to the organization of the sound pattern, right? Not to the individual elements, because the individual elements are just are the same. They're just restructured. They're just shuffled. So uh, this dorsal stream is responsible for this kind of um, uh, temporal prediction. And again, I emphasize prediction because the reason this is easy is because you can predict where sounds are going to happen because there's a clear beat structure, right? Da, 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 right? It's very obvious. But in the other case, you can't predict it very well. Okay, so we've gone through the uh, ventral and dorsal streams. They're responsible for all these different kinds of functions. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sort of rushing because uh, I want to get to the, um, uh, to the good part, which is pleasure. So I told you I was going to explain something about why we derive pleasure from it, and nothing in what I've said so far really uh, goes in that direction. So to understand pleasure, you really need to um, consider a very different system, which is found mostly subcortically. So here's a medial view of the brain, cut down the middle. Um, and there are several different structures, in particular the striatum that I'm showing here in color, <clears throat> along with other uh, regions like the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, orbital frontal cortex, amygdala, and so forth. This is, this is a simplified version of the wiring diagram. You can imagine what the real one looks like. This is from um, uh, Suzanne Haber's uh, anatomical work. Um, and one of the things that I am very interested in here is the connections to the striatum from the uh, cortex. And the reason I've colored them uh, is because they correspond topographically to the ventral and dorsal streams. So roughly speaking, the ventral part of the striatum receives its input from ventral portions of the um, uh, cortex, whereas the blue part here 
the dorsal striatum receives more inputs from the dorsal part. Um, so, what does this have to do with music? Well, the reason I'm showing you this image is because indeed, with uh, musical stimuli, we very consistently see uh, activation in this network uh, of the uh, striatum and other uh, related structures. So intramedial prefrontal cortex, striatum, uh, and of course, um, auditory areas and frontal areas. This is from a meta-analysis that we did recently across a large number of studies. <clears throat> but we see this response uh, very clearly with many different methodologies across uh, individual data sets. So here I'm showing you some of the earlier studies that we did. Uh, this one by Anne Blood, for example, um, who's now a researcher at Harvard, by the way. She's uh, at the Martino Center and works on dystonia. Uh, and, uh, Anne did the very first experiment with an old technique that we don't use anymore because it's, as you can see, it gives us kind of low resolution images. Um, but we were able to sh show that the ventral striatum is active when people are listening to highly pleasurable music. And that was very cool at the time, more than 20 years ago now. And subsequently, we've shown it with other methodologies. This one in particular is interesting, done, uh, a study done by Valerie Salampour, where we use a different um, imaging technique using a synthetic um, molecule that binds to dopamine D2 receptors. And uh, here we see, again, the striatum, but specifically, it's dopamine binding. So it's telling us that dopaminergic uh, systems are involved. And that's important because in the um, uh, reward system, it is well established that most of the reward neurons in that system are dopaminergic in nature. And in fact, in that very study, what we were able to show is, here's the same data I just showed you uh, here with PET, um, but we also scanned the same participants with fMRI and showed that the response in the striatum has two phases. One of them, which I call the anticipatory phase, occurs before the peak pleasure moment. So people are listening to their favorite music when they get a real chill, a strong emotional response, they press a button. So that's when we know what they're uh, experiencing. And during that whole period leading up to it, we see mostly a response in the dorsal stratum. Whereas immediately upon experiencing the pleasure and shortly thereafter, it reverses becomes the ventral stratum, that response. And that's important because it links to this idea of prediction, right? and anticipation. So what's going on here is you're expecting the peak moment to happen, and then you're experiencing that pleasure. And if we go back to this slide, so that was corresponding to this experiment. In this experiment, also carried out by Valerie, we used uh, fMRI and um, used a slightly different protocol, and I won't, maybe in the interest of time, I'll just skip this, but I'll just tell you that people heard um, separate individual uh, um, excerpts of music and had to say how much money they wanted to um, spend to be able to purchase that piece of music. So we use the money as an index of the value that's assigned to that piece of, of uh, music. And what we find is that the ventral striatum here is uh, active in relation to the amount of money spent. So the more you like something, the more money you're willing to spend to say, oh, I want a recording of that because it's so wonderful. And um, we see more activity in that region. But what was really cool in, in this experiment is that not only did the ventral stratum go up, but also it increased its connectivity with the auditory cortex, along with other parts of the uh, reward system. So in other words, the more you like something, the more your reward system is talking to your auditory system. The more exchange of information you have between the two systems. And that um, uh, finding, I think, is really quite critical because it brings together these two systems that I've been talking about. And it's the basis for the whole idea that musical pleasure derives from these interactions. So what uh, seems to be happening here, at least my Interpretation is that the uh, auditory parts of the brain, which are perceiving and predicting, uh, when something interesting happens, it generates a so-called prediction error. 
this prediction error is then uh, fed back to the reward system where a reward prediction error is uh, computed. This is the brain's response to something unexpected, but it's unexpectedly good, right? It's something better than what you were hoping for. This leads to the pleasure and the emotional arousal. It also leads to learning because, of course, the reward system is essentially uh, there for, for reinforcement learning, right? It's to guide us to take appropriate actions that enhance our well-being as opposed to pain, for example, which is a system to guide us away from dangerous and, and bad things. Um, and we can explain this even further based on what I was telling you about earlier, um, where these two systems have to do with patterns versus temporal uh, aspects. And this is why, I think, in the dorsal striatum, we have these responses that are anticipatory. We also have those um, uh, sort of rhythmic-related uh, responses. Uh, and the fact that this connects the reward system with parts of the brain that are known to be more involved in um, uh, these higher order processes like anticipating uh, events, planning for the future, uh, all those kinds of you know, more cognitive functions. So that makes sense anatomically. Uh, and conversely, the ventral stratum um, uh, connects to the ventral part of the cortex, but also to other structures uh, in the reward system, in particular uh, the amygdala and the orbitofrontal cortex, which are more, I would call, affective. <clears throat> And so that might be why you get this strong response here when you're actually experiencing the pleasure as opposed to anticipating it. Now, if, um, if all of that uh, that I just explained is correct, we can actually generate a series of predictions um, from that idea. So this is classic, you know, Popperian science where you generate a, a model from inductively from the data, and then you say, okay, if that's right, let's test it and see if it works. So in the remaining, I think I have 10 or 15 minutes, something like that. <clears throat> Somebody <laughs> keeping the time. I'll you know, go like this if I'm, <laughs> if I'm uh, over. So one of the first uh, ideas that we had is that, okay, if this is true, then what about when people uh, lose uh, the ability to experience pleasure? According to this model, it should be linked to a disruption of this communication between these two systems, right? That's a very straightforward prediction. So what do I mean by a loss of musical pleasure? Well, it turns out there are people with what we call specific music anhedonia. Um, and uh, the first experiments on this were done by my former uh, postdoc, uh, um, Ernest Mas Herrero. Uh, and uh, I think uh, Psyche will talk a little bit about this as well because she's done some nice, nice work on it. Um, and basically, these are people who, um, you know, they like everything else that the rest of us like. They like food, they like money, they like sex, but music, meh. It just doesn't do anything for them. Um, and we can also find people who are the opposite. We call them musical hyperhedonics, or um, uh, in French, we like to say meloman. These are people who you know, like everything else, but when they get to music, that's especially cool, right? So when we test uh, physiological responses, as we play music to these people, we measure um, uh, indices of arousal, just physiological arousal, like skin conductance and heart rate. And what we see is that people in these two categories show increases in these markers. Um, people with the musical anhedonia just don't they don't get anything. And this is consistent with what they tell us. When we put the wires on them and say, oh, I told you I don't enjoy music. You know, you don't believe me, but see, it's real. Um, on the other hand, if you give them other things, like if you give them uh, a money task, like a, a video game where you win money, they do show perfectly normal responses. So the next step, of course, is to put them into an fMRI scanner, which was done by Ernest and uh, Noelia Martinez Molina. Uh, with our, our collaboration with the University of Barcelona. Uh, and what we find is that um, the, uh, in red, you have the people with music anhedonia. In green and blue are the other two groups. So if you look at the um, stripes that corresponds to the monetary task, this is a monetary, it's called a monetary incentive delay task, commonly used as a kind of a gambling uh, game. And basically, you have a normal response here 
for uh, the nucleus accumbens, which is part of the uh, reward system, part of the ventral stratum. But when you look at the music, you see that the people with music anhedonia show actually a slightly negative response. So almost like an inhibition. It's like they, they really want to get out of the scanner. They don't want to hear this. They like the, they like the music. They like the uh, you know, money well enough, but they just don't want the music. But remember, our hypothesis is really about the interaction between the auditory and the reward system. So we really need to test how the auditory part of the brain is connecting or talking to the striatum. And when we look at the functional connectivity as a function of the three groups, we see that indeed the people with the music anhedonia show no connectivity during music listening or even slightly negative, whereas the people with the high um, uh, hyperhedonic show the greatest connectivity. So the more you like it, just like we saw in Valerie Salampour's experiment, the more interaction there is between these two systems. And if you don't like music, you just don't have that interaction. Now, this is a chicken and egg problem. We don't know if they don't, if they don't have that interaction because they don't like music or they don't like music because they don't have that interaction. And we can't really solve that problem directly. However, we can look at the structure of their brains. So we can look at the white matter connections, shown in red here, just to make it a, a stroop task. So the red corresponds to the white matter, the uh, green and blue corresponds to the gray matter. So it's interconnections between auditory and orbitofrontal cortex. And what we see is that uh, the people with the uh, music anhedonia, who are on the low end of this scale here, are the ones who have higher diffusivity in this tract. So this is using diffusion um, uh, MRI. It's a way of looking at the integrity or um, properties of the white matter. And, uh, and we see that the people who really score low on our scale of musical uh, anhedonia, meaning they really are the anhedonics, have greater diffusivity, so a poorer structural anatomical connection between those systems. So we give ourselves a green check mark there. It seems to be true that those who have a loss of uh, musical pleasure have a disruption in that system. Now, that's fine, and we were very happy with that, but our critics said, um, you know, yes, but uh, you, know, you haven't actually proven that um, if you manipulate that system, you will get that same response. All you've shown is some kind of correlation. People who don't like music, who have anhedonia, don't have this pattern. OK, that's good, but it's not enough. You really need to show a direct causal effect. So how do we do that? Well, it's tricky, but um, it can be done. And um, my former colleague, uh, Antonio Strafella, uh, who's now in Toronto, um, devised this technique where if you stimulate the frontal cortex, you can actually change the activity of the um, striatum. So how do we stimulate? Well, we use a technique called transcranial magnetic stimulation which uh, involves placing a coil on top of the head. You pass a current through this coil, uh, which generates uh, um, uh, a magnetic uh, flux, which goes through the skull, which is why it's transcranial, and then it depolarizes the neurons in that location. Um, but because of the connection that I showed you earlier between the frontal cortex and the striatum, we can actually influence that structure. And best of all, with TMS, we can... Um, use two different types of stimulation, um, which produces either an inhibitory or an excitatory response. In other words, we can upregulate the neurons or we can downregulate them. And so um, Ernest, who uh, did a postdoc in my lab, decided to do this project. And I told him this can't possibly work. It's crazy. And he said, let me try it. And of course, it worked beautifully. I should always uh, listen to your students as one thing I've learned over the years. Um, and so indeed, when we look at, um, so we stimulate the brain with these two different um, um, types of, of stimulation and a control condition. Then we ask people to listen to music and give us ratings of how much they like it. We measure the skin conductance and we do the monetary task. We ask how much money would you spend? And sure enough, um, the uh, um, uh, blue is the excitatory and the red is the inhibitory. You see the pattern. It's very clear. 
that um, you actually like the music more or less depending on the kind of stimulation you received. And it changes the physiology as well. Now, people will look at this and say, yeah, but what about the replication crisis and blah, 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 and you only have 17 subjects and blah, blah, blah. This is reviewer two. So reviewer two, we do another experiment with a new group of subjects, a new set of stimuli, et cetera, and we replicate the exact same thing. So it's a very, very reliable finding. Uh, I won't go through that detail. But what we did then was to put those people into the fMRI scanner because the idea is that when we stimulate, we're changing this connection in the brain, right? But we don't have the proof of what's actually happening with the stimulation unless we scan them. So when we scan them, and then we look at the functional connectivity between the auditory cortex, now in pink, uh, and the um, striatum, now in blue, we see this relationship. In other words, the change in liking, uh, as measured behaviorally, is related to the change in connectivity between these two structures. So the more the stimulation enhances your connectivity, the more you're going to like it. And the more the stimulation decreases the connectivity, the less you're going to like it. And so that, I think, is pretty decent evidence of a causal relationship um, between, uh, of, the of the importance of the connection between those two systems. OK. Um, last two bits I'm going to go uh, quickly because it just gets into the neurochemistry a little bit. Um, so I mentioned earlier that we had evidence that the dopaminergic system was involved from the PET scanning experiments. And again, that's important because if you look at all the animal neurophysiology, upon which a lot of our ideas are based, by the way, um, people like Wolfram Schultz and many others who've, who've worked in this domain for years, what, uh, what they emphasize is that those, those neurons are dopaminergic. So again, we want to emphasize this idea of causal evidence. Can we actually show that um, either enhancing or depleting dopamine will have an effect? So for that, we go back to Barcelona. Um, and uh, this is a study carried out with collaborators from the Hospital de la Santa Creu y San Pau. It's, it's the only time I've ever done an experiment at a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So that was kind of cool. And this was led, actually, by my uh, Italian colleague, Laura Ferreri, who is now a professor at uh, Pavia. And uh, I won't go through the details, but basically, this is a pharma pharmacological experiment where we gave people either risperidone or uh, levodopa, uh, as well as a placebo. This was done under very controlled conditions uh, with a team of people who do this routinely for for various clinical experiments. And so levodopa is a dopamine precursor, so it's going to enhance dopamine neurotransmission, whereas risperidone is going to suppress it. And uh, the results uh, go pretty much in the expected duration. So uh, electrodermal activity or um, skin conductance goes up or down in relation to the um, dopaminergic uh, inhibitor or uh, precursor. Similarly for the money uh, measure. And similarly for the chills, this is an index of how many chills were experienced. You see fewer chills when people had been given risperidone and uh, not so much when they were given levodopa. Um, and uh, when we measure the skin conductance, by the way, we see this change as well. And we also see it in the control task, which is the monetary incentive delay. And that makes sense because the, uh, the money task is also known to be a dopaminergic dependent um, reward based task. So this is kind of our control to be sure that the manipulation worked. We weren't sure if this was going to work, of course, but this is our proof that it does work. And then when we apply it to music, you get the same effect. So again, a little green check mark. Um, but then there are people um, who say, well, dopamine is, is great, but it's not actually responsible for pleasure. So uh, Kent Barrage, for example, um, uh, might argue this based on some, some you know, extraordinary um, animal studies that have been done. Um, and so we needed to address this because it's not entirely clear whether the kinds of experiments done with animals that usually involve primary rewards, like uh, receiving um, water when the mouse is very thirsty, it's not clear if that really corresponds in the same way to 
these higher order kinds of uh, functions that we're looking at in humans. So we decided to do the identical experiment that we did with dopamine, but this time with an opioid manipulation because there is all this evidence that opioids are in fact more responsible for the pleasurable response. And so I won't go through the details here either, but we gave people very um, uh, controlled doses of oxycodone or uh, naltrexone, which are classic um, uh, opioid uh, uh, modulating drugs. And basically, I won't go through the details here either because it's very easy uh, uh, answer. There's no modulation of any of the behavioral scores. So we looked at everything. We looked at liking rates. We looked at number of chills. We looked at the um, electrodermal, uh, sorry, we looked at the um, emotional arousal. None of them showed any change at all, which is a bit surprising. And we thought, well, maybe the dose we gave wasn't right or you know, whatever. But when we look at the skin conductance, we do see a clear modulation. And again, we use the monetary task as our control because that's a known task. Um, and we see a change, um, uh, greater uh, uh, skin conductance response to the payoff when you, this is when you, when you get the money that you were expecting, when you get more money than you were expecting, actually. Um, you see a greater response uh, in the oxycodone condition than in the naltrexone condition. And very much the same thing with the music pleasure. So that's super interesting because it's actually a dissociation between the uh, sort of subjective affective response and the physiological arousal measure. And so we give ourselves mostly uh, an X here, but a little check mark because there is a role for opioids but not in what um, uh, one might have expected from the literature, which is to say not in response to pleasure as such, um, subjective aspects, but more in terms of the physiological response. So uh, I hope I'm not out of time. I'm just going to end here by reiterating the, the basic idea, which is that um, music is sort of a, a mechanism that we, we perhaps stumbled upon or, or something as, as a species, but we're very, um, uh, at least I'm very happy that <laughs> this happened because uh, it means that we're able to generate these emotions that we all feel so strongly and that this happens via the interaction between these two systems. And what's interesting is that the reward system is actually phylogenetically quite ancient, right? It's why all those studies done with rodents, for example, um, are, uh, are very important because they tell us about the functional properties of the reward system. Uh, whereas the parts of the brain that are involved in the perceptual and predictive functions are mostly uh, relatively new phylogenetically, especially the frontal cortex, but also auditory cortex. If you look at the auditory cortex of uh, a macaque, for example, which is often used in this research, um, in neuroscience research, their auditory system is, is relatively less developed than that of the human. So we have a kind of an advanced cognitive perceptual predictive system, which in turn uh, sends signals and receives signals to this ancient uh, uh, reward system. And that, uh, I think, is why music has both you know, a very important sort of uh, cognitive intellectual uh, learning aspect, uh, as well as this more primal kind of um, affective response. And so with that, I'll just uh, finish and be sure to thank uh, all the uh, various uh, people who have been involved, um, whom I've named, I think, mostly, uh, and my funders. And uh, thank you all very much for your attention. Uh, we may take a minute or two of questions. If, uh, Psyche, you want to set yourself up in the meantime. Yes. Hi, Robert. That was great. Um, how do you think about um, why we like familiar music, or why even after listening to a musical piece for a hundred times, uh, we still get uh, pleasure? Yeah. Uh, and the second question is, why do anhedonic, uh, musical anhedonics actually find it irritable? Why do they just not react to it at all? Yeah. Well, um, 
In terms of the second question, they don't all find it um, terrible. They usually, some do, but many of them say, well, it's sort of boring. Um, and one person I remember said to me, uh, it's like going to hear a lecture in a language you don't understand. It's like, yeah, I sit there, but I, I just don't get it, you know. Um, in relation to the first question, uh, there, there are many aspects to that. It's, a, it's an important question. Um, I think I would uh, go back to the idea from, from uh, music cognition of um, verid veridical versus um, schematic. And so those are fancy names for just saying, if you know the piece, you've heard it many times, you know exactly how it's going to go, your long-term memory representation is veridical. It's like you know what's going to happen, right? So according to that, the pleasure should decrease because your, um, your prediction error will decrease, right? You're, you know what's going to happen, so it happens just as you predict. However, there's also the schematic expectancy, which is how well does that particular piece relate to the global statistics of what usually happens? And so I'll give you a very simple example. If you have a deceptive cadence, right? You have a, a one chord, a four chord, a five chord, and then a six chord instead of back to a one chord. Um, even if you know it's going to happen, because in that piece of music it happens all the time, um, it still violates the statistical global expectancy. And so it still constitutes a sur surprise right, in, in that sense. And I think um, musicians are very aware of this. And there's also a secondary point, which is that um, in live performance at least, and this is possibly why live performance often is, is more uh, pleasurable, you, um, you can make the predictions, but they're not going to be as accurate as in a recording. And then it depends on the style of music. Of course, in some styles of music, you have improvisations, you have all kinds of things that the performer does to try to engage you more. And it often has to do with violating your expectations, like doing something different, something new, something exciting, something fun. Okay. Hi, uh, thank you so much for your talk. My name is Zach, I'm a sophomore at Harvard. Um, my question is, would you expect to see a difference in the dopamine responses between music that someone is listening to versus music that someone who plays in an instrument is playing? Yeah, that's a super interesting question. Um, I think um, it, it's something we actually want to do because we, we actually have musical instruments that we can play in the scanner. We have a, a piano keyboard and we have a cello, which is, is a lot of fun. Um, and uh, I'm pretty sure that there would be uh, a response. Just, you know, if you just ask musicians, they'll tell you, well, uh, yes, I, you know, I'm really feeling a strong emotion as I'm playing. But I think it may also vary in relation to, uh, first of all, sort of expertise or mastery. And, um, and secondly, you know, are you, are you like practicing? In other words, are you trying to get a particular technical effect? Or are you in this sort of flow state when you're playing and you're just you know, in, in this altered state almost, right? Which um, many musicians report. And my prediction would be that in the latter case is when you would see a much more uh, uh, dopamine response. In the former case, I'm not so sure because maybe you're not focusing on the emotion, you're focusing on, you know, did I get that damn trail to come out on the left hand or whatever it is? <laughs> All right, thank you. I'm sure there are many questions. We have the whole day together and Robert is kindly staying with us. So um, please try to catch him at the breaks, but I think Psyche is ready. So our next speaker. Yes. <laughs>